My name's Walter Smith, and this is the 101 Bible class, the, the best in the church, in my opinion. <laughs> Someone said this is just an opinion, and it's not too much, especially if it's self-rewarding. But uh, sometimes you just can't help it, you know, can't help it at all. But anyway, uh, anybody, everybody had a good week, I suppose. Everybody's got a smile on the face. Nobody's frowning. That's good. Undoubtedly, you must say your prayers. That's good. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. And then uh, when I go to bed at night, I say my prayers too. I was taught that. You know what you're taught as a youth, you carry on unless you get sidetracked some way. And that's easy to do, to be sidetracked. Uh, we just got to avoid hazards as we can, and we've got to pray that we won't have these hazards. And when we do have, have them, we need to pray to the Lord to protect us. Because as a Christian, you know who's after us? Satan. He wants us to mess up. He wants us to not be alert. And uh, this is somewhat of the lesson today. We need to be alert. Because we can really go under fast if you're not alert. May we pray. Our Father, we come to you in, with thankful hearts, thanking you for the blessings this week. And we thank you for this church. And we thank you for our leaders. And we thank you that we have food to eat and we have a place to sleep. And we ask a special blessing for those who are in need, dear Heavenly Father. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins, dear Heavenly Father, and help us to be better Christians where we sin less. Thank you so much for being a good God, and thank you for our pastor. And bless the members of this church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anyway, our lesson today is somewhat of a historical lesson. It's about... Uh, the Babylonian captivity. And one particular person that was in it that was became a leader and a, a staunch uh, religious person and a leader in the church and a, a blessing to all. And his name was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was at the end of the Babylonian captivity and he had gotten permission from Cyrus the Persian king to go and build a, a fence or a wall that had been torn down in Jerusalem and uh, he had a position with Cyrus he was the cupbearer but Cyrus thought so much of him that he allowed him to go to Jerusalem and do some construction work and build back the city because Jewish people had been in captivity for right out a hundred years wouldn't it be bad to be in captivity for a hundred years who else was in captivity Daniel was wasn't he but he was also a leader with that group, although it wasn't his country. You remember he prayed for a message of prophecy, or he wanted to get this message of prophecy through so he knew what the future of Israel was going to be. And he finally got his answer after a delay. Daniel was a man the Bible describes as being greatly loved of God. And I'm sure Nehemiah was too. But anyway, here's a little information on Nehemiah. A Jewish leader of the 5th century B.C. He was appointed governor of Judea by the Persians a century after the Jews had been released from their Babylonian captivity. Nehemiah rebuilt the still devastated city of Jerusalem and rallied the Jewish people to new efforts. During this productive period, they followed Nehemiah 
they followed Nehemiah was a civil leader. Ezra, the religious leader. So uh, Nehemiah was a civil leader being the governor of Judea. And Ezra was uh, the priest and the scribe and a religious leader of the area. And they worked as a partner's. In the early Hebrew canon, the books of Nehemiah and Ezra were considered as one. They were first separated as the first and second books of Esdras. The second book was later given the name of Nehemiah. The books of Nehemiah and Ezra provide a comprehensive history of the return of the exiles and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So, we see that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are both in Jerusalem and they're teaching what God wants the people to know. And it goes back to Moses, God's laws. And uh, we see that Ezra, along with 13 other helpers, was reading was reading the the laws out to the people and the people were very sad because of their sins and then they turned to being joyful and they had a celebration. We all are sins as humans and we regret our sins if we're true Christians and we don't sin as much after we get saved. And a good Christian guards against sin we know that sin will bring you down as a Christian and we know that you can get forgiveness too if you're sincere and you don't continually do it all the time so we know that Nehemiah was very alert and our lesson today is relating to our ability to be alert and to listen how many consider themselves good listeners? I think most of us do, but sometimes we don't listen to the right people and we get into trouble too in that area. But of all the communications that people do, they say listening is about 45%. Other communications together, 75 to 80%. But listening accounts for about 45% of the information we take in. It would be bad not to be able to hear, wouldn't it? Someone said, I think I like uh, to, s I'd rather have eyes than a nose. And uh, I believe seeing is very important too. Uh, I'm thinking I wouldn't want to be without hearing, but I sure wouldn't want to be without seeing. And I believe that uh, you need both of them. You can get hearing aids and you can get glasses, you know, to improve on both of them. And uh, when you lose one, it's a sad day. There's no question about it. But we, our lesson today is primarily about being a good listener and being able to spread it to other people and being able to take notes and uh, be able to write them down. And a month from then, you can give the sermon yourself that you heard or the information you heard. Some things are so interesting and shocking that you don't need any notes. Can you think of anything like that? 9-11, that was so shocking, wasn't it? You didn't really need any notes to remember that to this day. Pearl Harbor, when it was attacked, uh, you didn't need any notes about that because it was very devastating. It united the American people to go to war. Someone said it would have been a probably a failure, or we would have been a failure probably if we had not been united. So there's one thing about it. We need to be united on anything we do as it relates to Christianity or as it relates to our country. And divided we fall, united we stand. That's very important. And uh, Abraham Lincoln confirmed that for us.
The name of the lesson is Hear God's Word. And what are some things you love to listen to? Out of the clear blue sky, what do you like to listen to? What's that? DDN radio. Yeah, well, that's good. Soft music. What's that? Good music. Good music, yeah. Good music's good, I'm isn't it? Soft. Yeah. I like to hear your favorite uh, TB minister, or several of them. You like to hear our minister. We like to. Hear our neighbor sometimes. <laughs> if you got a good neighbor, that is. But we're supposed to love our neighbor and we're supposed to get along with them. If we don't, then we're not doing what Jesus tells us to do. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? Is it? Can you do that? We know we love ourselves. Some people do. I had a roommate... And sometimes I wondered if he loved himself or he might have loved himself too much. But he was very depressed one day. He, we were freshmen in college. And he woke up one morning, he looked in the mirror, and he came in there and he says, I'm going to kill myself. I said, kill yourself? Why do you want to do that? He said, I'm getting bald. He had always gotten compliments on his blonde hair. And he loved his blonde hair, and he loved those compliments, and people would congratulate him on his. So you got a nice head of hair there. You're blonde, too. You look so nice. And I said, why would you want to kill yourself because of losing your hair? He said, no girls are going to look at me being bald-headed. And I said, I don't think that's any truth in that. And I said, look at uh, the movie stars that are bald. Uh, you can name several of them. And uh, can you name a movie star that was bald back in the 50s? Yul Brenner. Yeah. Yul Brenner. I said, look at Yul Brenner. I said, the women just go crazy over <laughs> And uh, he thought, well, that was a good compliment. He didn't commit suicide then. But about three years ago, that was in the 50s, he did commit suicide. I don't think it was because he lost hair, but he had a problem he couldn't cope with. And when he thought about something he liked and it didn't work out or he had a problem, he'd resort to that. said, I'd just be better dead, you know, than alive. He had a bad, he had nobody to encourage him. Of course, he was divorced twice. And uh, that might have had something to do with it. He had some children. But they say people that are, commit suicide are the type that can't cope with certain problems or a particular problem. They don't see a way out. But we know that God allows things to happen to straighten us out sometimes, you know, and some people can't be straightened out. And we have to be a good neighbor to people that have that kind of personality. And uh, I wish I could have been around when he was depressed, but he was 400 miles away, you know. You can all, as a Christian, you can always think of something, but we know that Jesus Christ uh, will make you stronger sometimes by going through trials. And if you've never had any problems at all, then when you do have a problem, it's real bad. But we're supposed to look for people and listen for people who have a need, and we're supposed to help them in that respect. I can be at Walmart, and this last week, and a fellow came by, and he says, can I have all the change in your pocket? I looked at him, and he was not dressed well, he hadn't combed his hair, he was in terrible shape. And I said, yeah. I had a couple of dollars of change, I guess. I gave it to him. And uh, he, 
What I was doing, I was trying to open my car door because I'd locked my keys in it. He caught me. <laughs> and uh, he said, can I help you with that? And I said, I think I can handle it myself. I appreciate it, though. And uh, it wasn't but 10 minutes. The Lord gave me a way to open that door, and I opened it. And I thanked the Lord for it. And I looked for that fellow because I wanted to give him more money because I knew the Lord had helped me in my situation. And I never could find him. But guess what? I saw another fellow on the side of the road near Walmart. He was sitting down. He was an older gentleman. And I knew he was begging for money. And I dropped by and gave him some money because I knew that was the Lord that helped me with my my problem. That's the way it is. If you'll help others, God will come to your rescue and help you. And it's very important that we help our neighbor and that we sometimes don't understand why we're helping them. But it has to do with welfare for yourself too. And not only only because you love him, you feel sorry for him. So it's very important. And we got to use our senses in order to see people that are in need, we got to listen and listen to hear what hear what they say, and we got to come up with an answer from the Holy Spirit that dwells within each Christian. And the Holy Spirit is always willing to help you have a solution to your problem. And if you got a problem, you pray about it, pray sincerely, and guess what? The Lord will come to your rescue. And it's amazing. It's like magic. I've seen it come through. Many times, Merle and I both have. We prayed on several occasions where God came through and helped us. And it looked like we were going to fail in what we were going to do. And God came to us. And he's there. Jesus is our brother. He loves us. We love him. And God is our father. And if we have a problem, we pray. Or we have a friend that will pray with you. Or else you have a friend, you'll pray for him. That's what Christianity is about, helping others. Anyway, in Nehemiah, we have in the 8th chapter, we're only going to get into the 8th chapter of Nehemiah. It said, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. And I'm not talking about Nixon Watergate, we're talking about the Watergate East Gate of the fence or the perimeter of Jerusalem. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. So uh, the people hadn't had any training or any law given to them in many years, and most of the people that were taken in exile were dead, and these were new people that had never been acquainted with Jerusalem or what the law of Moses had to say. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law, brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out it from the daybreak until noon before the men and women and the, those who can, could understand. In other words, they had children of uh, uh, good age. They could understand if they were small, four and five, six, well, five. They probably couldn't understand what he was talking about. All the people listened attentively. To the book of the law. And that's what this lesson is about, is to listen and take notes and be sure that we have this in our mind when the test comes. It says, Water Gate, uh, a gate in the wall around Jerusalem located on the eastern side of the city. And uh, it says that... Uh, because of people's persistence of disobedience, 
the city of Jerusalem suffered an invading army's destruction and the people experienced the Babylonian captivity. After 70 years of surviving remnants returned from captivity. When they came back, they endeavored to rebuild the temple, Jerusalem, and the city walls around it. When they had completed rebuilding the walls, all the people gathered together and asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. The Israelites were desperate to hear God's word again, and they were very intentional in putting themselves in a position to listen to it. Did you know that you're in trouble if you someone dies and it's intentional? That's murder, isn't it? You get in trouble. If someone dies and it's not intentional, it's an accident, you might not get off free, but you don't. It's not a capital punishment uh, if it's an accident. But uh, sometimes because of our negligence and common sense, uh, we will spend time in prison, lots of time. So we need to be very alert when you drive a car. And did you know every time Myrtle gets in the car and she drives to Gainesville, it scares her because of all the traffic. Didn't used to be that much, did it? Much traffic, but it's improving all the time. And we got to be very alert, especially on our blind spot. And as human beings, we have blind spots that we have to have someone to point them out to us as it, uh, as it relates to life. It says, uh, be intentional together. We need to be intentional about doing good things. It said, be intentional in time and place. We're <clears throat> at the time and at the place. Uh, <clears throat> when you're in a tent revival, you listen. If you're in the church, you listen. And you use your eyes too. And you stay alert at all times. Because you never know what's around the corner. It says we must be intentional about gathering to hear God's word, read and talk. In Hebrews 10.25, the biblical writer exhorted God's people to not neglect gathering together. While most believers are intentional about gathering on Sundays, the key principle is for us to meet to hear God's word on a regular and systematic basis. <coughs> what are some obstacles in hearing God's word? Well, it's got 13 Levites that helped this scribe give the lesson of Moses' law. And all of them are pretty hard to pronounce. Jamin, uh, Josabad, Pilesi, Later. But anyway, it's good to learn to pronounce foreign words too, <laughs> or foreign words or names, so you can help a person that is a foreigner. Read out the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. That's what the Levites did. They were helpers. And they were a priest coming from the tribe of Levi. And Levi was one of the disciples, I mean one of Jacob's sons, one of the twelve. Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, and the Levites were one of the twelve tribes of Israel. The sons of Levi served as priest. Someone told me that it was a, a Jewish person that gave us Levi jeans. And you know where they came about? On the gold fields in California in 1849. Somebody needed some heavy trousers to work in, do some gold mining. And his name was Levi. And so after he built 
made one pair, somebody else wanted a pair. And the next thing you know, he stopped gold, mining gold and started uh, making trousers, Levi trousers. And today they're probably the most popular jeans you can buy. Anybody ever have a pair of Levi's? <laughs> most of them have. In this setting, they read God's word, explained it, and translated its meaning so that the people could understand what was real. It says, Nehemiah also highlights the congregation's responsibility as they assembled to hear God's word taught. All the people listened attentively. Whenever we hear scripture and read, read and taught, we should do what? Uh, with engaged hearts seeking to understand God's word combining the responsibility of both the pastor and the congregation we learn learn the basis components for the spiritually fruitful assembly of God's people those who shepherd the church faithfully present the scriptures so God's people can understand them God's people come with an attentive spirit ready to understand what their leaders teach. Yet a sermon or Bible study is not just another lecture or podcast. These are the very words of life. Our souls are meant to run on. Therefore, we must work hard to strengthen our listening skills. Consider the following recommendations for better engaging and understanding what we hear says pray pray the promised prayer open your eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instruction pray that the person preaching or teaching does so in a faithful and intelligible way so that all who hear can better understand God's word open your own Bible open your own copy of God's word to follow along with the preacher or teacher It said, take good notes. They say that a person that can take good notes can give that sermon a month later that he heard. It's good to take notes on things of that nature, but as I indicated earlier, we don't need to take notes on something that's tragic or something wonderful when a baby is born. I remember when my son Daniel was born... I was so joyful and cheerful that uh, I was away from home and I called up and found out about it in the hospital I talked with Myrtle and I was so elated that uh, it took me a, a little time to get home to find out where I was. I was in Albany, Georgia, passing through. But uh, something I don't need any notes about because I know exactly everything that I heard on the telephone. It was good. It said immediately talk about it. In other words, if there's something good, talk about it to people and let them know what it is and spread the good news. It says take it with you. Resist temptation to close the book once the sermon or study is over. Review and add your notes during the week as you continue thinking through what God taught you. And then it says we have... You gain deeper understanding by hearing Scripture explain. Scripture has a lot of mysteries in it. When you read Revelation, you say, what does that mean? Or you read sometimes Psalms, you'll wonder what it means. It's usually self-explanatory. Most Scriptures, are you can come up with an answer. But there's a some people need to be able to explain it to you because you haven't studied the language you haven't studied, uh, the people, and the customs. It says, Nehemiah 9 through 12. Nehemiah, the governor, he was a governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, 
Go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing repaired since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions, and have a great, had a great celebration because they had understood the words that were explained to them. Yes, they uh, were sad because they thought about their Babylonian captivity and what the people did to get into it. But after it was, they told them not to grieve, that that was over with, and rejoice and celebrate. And that's exactly what you did. They did. Don't grieve. Because God take it was taking care of the problem and had forgiven them. The people in Nehemiah's day had rebelled against God in the past. They failed to take God at his word and had been unfaithful to his commands. But notice the people's response as they received instruction. All people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. As the people understood the scriptures, God's truth confronted their sin. It reminded them of their waywardness and his holiness. And for that reason, the Israelites grieved over their sin. The people's response was indeed appropriate. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than a two-edged sword. Anybody ever heard that before? The word of God is as sharp as a two-edged sword. As far as the separation of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word works effectively in you who believe. If you don't believe, God's word doesn't help at all, does it? Because you have no right to, to get an answered prayer. And a person who's not saved has nothing to pray but a sinner's prayer. Because God, you're not one of his children if you're not saved, or one of his saved children. It says, how can attitude of heart affect how we hear God's word? God doesn't use scripture just to make us feel bad. Certainly we should feel sorrow over our sin. This is good and spiritually healthy. But it is not God's intention to leave us in that state. In the good news of God's gospel, conviction is only half the story. Conviction only half the story. There's good news after that. It says Israelites could rejoice because God's presence remained with them. Presence remained with them. Therefore, the people were commanded to go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. In our day, we might be told, go to the grocery store and fill your cart with cookies, cakes, and chips, and get enough to share with your neighbor, because this is a celebration. This is God's amazing grace at, all of, at its most amazing. As you experience God's word and are convicted of your sin, repent, Grieve over it where appropriate. There is no more condemnation. Thank him for his grace and forgiveness and rejoice and celebrate over what he has done in your life. The Holy Spirit is a greater guide than the Levites. God's presence is with you. What are some ways we can better position ourselves to hear God's word? Well, we respond to the, to the scripture. It says that uh, when you read or hear God's word, you're convicted. Deal with it. Confess your sin and turn from it. Thank God for giving you, forgiving you, and setting you free. Be intentional. You cannot become a better listener by accident. Continue to, in the following practices for several weeks and see how they positively affect retention and obedience to God's word. Find community. God expects you to personally read his word, but you're also expected to hear it in the context of Christian community. 
Make a commitment to be part of a Bible study group or class. Commit to helping each other discover and live out God's Word. So we have a responsibility to be gregarious and be with other people. We don't want to be a hermit. We want to mix in with the people and we want to spread our gift that God has given us. Any questions on anything we've covered or want to add something to it? Anybody had a personal experience? Uh, Jim, you want to sing us a song? Uh, have you already done one? No. No? You're not going to? I, I didn't bring my instrument. We'll now have a song by Jim DeLay. <clears throat> Teacher of this class. One of them. One of the teachers of the class. <laughs> this is a song Jimmy Dickens wrote some years ago. I guess before he got into the sausage business. It's called Drinking from My Saucer. Well, I never made a fortune And it's probably too late now But I don't worry about that much I'm happy anyhow As I go along life's journey I'm reaping better than I've sowed I'm drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed I don't have a lot of riches And sometimes the way gets tough but I've got a friend in Jesus And that makes me rich enough I just thank God for his blessings And the mercy he's bestowed I'm drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed Now I remember when things went wrong And sometimes the going's rough but Then the dark clouds would break And the sun would peek through again so Lord, help me not to gripe about the tough rows I have hold. I'm drinking from my saucer cause my cup has overflowed. If God gives me strength and courage, though the way seems steep and rough, I'll not ask for other blessings. I'm already blessed enough. May I never be too busy to help another bear his load. Then I'll keep drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed Yeah, I'll keep drinking from my saucer Cause my cup has overflowed